Okay. Well, thank you, Wes, and thank you, Kyle, for your help. And thanks to everyone for joining us tonight to talk about the Mills family. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of the Betsy Mills Club, and maybe you've even heard of Betsy Gates Mills, the woman for whom it was named, but rarely do we talk about the rest of the Mills family. So we're going to try to enlighten you this evening on um, the, the Mills family that's behind the Betsy Mills Club and all of the contributions that they've made to the community through the years. And for my part of the program, I'm going to talk about the very early Mills family in Marietta because they've been a part of Marietta since the very beginning. And then Scott and Jerry will continue with the rest of the story about the later Mills families. The Mills family originally came to Marietta from the Boston area where they lived in the late 18th century. Uh, John and Abigail Marshall Mills were the parents of six sons and two daughters and all six of their sons had something to do with Ohio, but the daughters didn't come here or have anything to do. So we're not going to talk about them tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to focus mainly on William Mills and his wife, Sally Bowman, who were the progenitors of the Mills family in Marietta. But the first of the Mills to have uh, an interest in the Marietta area was John Mills, the oldest of the Mills brothers out of Boston. And what you see here is a painting of John Mills that was owned by uh, the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. Sorry. Thanks. Uh, John Mills, as you can see, was uh, an officer during the American Revolution. And uh, after that, he uh, came into Ohio and resumed his military career in Western Ohio, where he was Adjutant General of the United States troops during the Indian Wars. He was also the commander of Fort Greenville, where the treaty with the Native Americans was signed to end the Indian Wars in 1795. And then the document that you see on the left of the screen is from the minutes of the Ohio Company of Associates. And I think probably everyone here also is familiar with the Ohio Company, that group of Revolutionary War veterans that joined together and purchased land here in southeastern Ohio and founded Marietta. Well, you can see this is a, uh, the minutes from their meeting in Boston in 1786 in March. They met at the Bunch of Grapes Tavern, and this was the meeting where they actually founded the Ohio Company. And you can see John Mill's name right next to the Red Star. Uh, he was one of the delegates, there are only 11 delegates there, and he was one of the delegates from Suffolk County, uh, Massachusetts, and he later owned two-fifths of a share in the Ohio Company. So we think this is probably where the Mills family got their uh, initial interest in Ohio. William Mills, uh, the one who had the most to do with Marietta, also served in the American Revolution. And following the war, he married Sally Bowman in 1785 in Massachusetts. And William, along with his brother Charles, is named on Rufus Putnam's list of the settlers who arrived in Marietta in 1789. And their younger brother, Benjamin, is also on this list, but on another page. While William spent uh, much of his time here in Marietta, Charles and Benjamin went on to settle in Gallia County. And here's another little family tree uh, that shows the Mills family, It's the family of William and Sarah Bowman Mills. Uh, when William came to Marietta in 1789, he had left his wife and children behind in Massachusetts. Um, and he had, they had three children there. And you can see that in 1788, they had a daughter born and they, and they named her Marietta. They were so excited about Marietta being founded in 1788 that they named their third child Marietta. By 1792, William had brought his wife and children to Marietta, and they uh, had a house at the Point. The Point is the area down where the Muskingum and the Ohio uh, joined together, and it's the vicinity of the Lafayette Hotel today. And uh, you can see on the list of residents at the Point is Captain William Mills. And uh, living right next door, number 11, is Dr. Jabez True. At least his office was there. And you can see they were right next door on the sketch of um, the point. 
And other than the fear and the hardships of the Indian War, uh, things were going pretty well for the Mills family about this time. William Mills had been appointed captain of the artillery of uh, the local militia company. And uh, another son was born to them named John Mills in 1795. And you'll hear a little bit more about him later. He had played an important role in the story of Marietta. But then in 1796, uh, the older brother, John Mills, who was uh, serving in the military in Western Ohio, uh, died. And you can see here, uh, he must have been a fairly respected military man in the West because the residents of Dark County in Greenville uh, erected this marker uh, to him. And Major John Mills left uh, much of his estate to his brother William, half of his estate to his brother William, and made him the executor of the estate. So William Mills left Marietta at that time and went West uh, to attend to his brother's land and and settling up the estate. And by 1801, he was living in Vincennes, Indiana, deeply in debt. And he was gone so long that Sally Bowman Mills, his wife, had had enough by 1801 and she filed for divorce. <laughs> So the document that you see here in the background is the deposition of Griffin Green, Sally's neighbor, on her behalf. And Griffin Green was one of the directors of the Ohio Company, and he was one of the pioneers of Marietta. And what Griffin Green has to say uh, sheds a little bit more light on the Mills family situation as it was in 1801. And Griffin Green says, that William Mills has unreasonably absented himself from his wife and family without just cause. That Sally has supported herself and family by her own industry, while William was in dissolute indolence, dissipating a property bequeathed to him by his brother, the late Major John Mills. Last winter, William returned to his family, but conducted himself in a manner so abusive and menacing to Sally as to excite in her such alarming apprehensions for her personal safety, while William lived in a state of wild intoxication. <laughs> <laughs> then the dwelling house and furniture of William and Sally was sold at sheriff's sale for payment of William's debts. William left Marietta in March and went into the Indiana Territory from whence he has not returned. And I do declare that Sally hath at all times conducted herself with uncommon industry and due economy for the support of herself and children and has the esteem of the respectable inhabitants of the town of Marietta. So the Supreme Court couldn't argue with that. And so the Supreme Court of the Northwest Territory approved an act for the divorce of Sally Bowman Mills from William Mills on December 19, 1801. And that was one of the first divorces in the Northwest Territory. So William was a little surprised and upset by this. <laughs> so he wrote to his attorney, Paul Fearing, here in Marietta, about the disagreeable business. And he especially wants to know whether Dr. True is to have not only my wife, but must he have my goods and furniture also? <laughs> Hard and not fair. So we don't know what happened in the meantime, because this is 1802, uh, but something must have been going on with Dr. True, because then in 1806, Sally Bowman Mills married Dr. Jabez True, who had been her neighbor at the point earlier on. <laughs> So, but Dr. True had been one of the earliest physicians in Marietta. He also taught school in the blockhouse. He served as Washington County treasurer. And Dr. Samuel Hildreth says of Dr. True that he was a man of whom no enemy could say hard things and whom everyone loved and respected. A little bit of a change from William. <laughs> so Sally's life had changed for the better following the divorce, but Williams declined. And in January of 1807, William died at Vincennes, Indiana.
But Sally Mills True and her new husband Jabez lived prosperously in Marietta for the next 16 years, raising Sally's children until Jabez True died during the epidemic and sickly seasons of 1823 and left nearly all of his extensive property to his wife, Sally. Also due to the death of Sally's daughter, Sarah Mills Guiteau, Sally raised her two granddaughters, Julia and Sarah. Her granddaughter, Sarah, made, married Professor John Kendrick of Kenyon College in Gambier, who later became a professor at Marietta College. Uh, and Sally spent the last two years of her life in the family of her granddaughter in Gambier. And the documents you see to the right of the screen here is a letter from Sally's grandson-in-law, uh, John Kendrick, to her son, John Mills, who was still living here in Marietta. And he speaks of Sally's final illness. Uh, she was very feeble in the June of 1836. And he says that it has weighed heavily upon Sally's mind to think that the prospect was growing more faint that she should be again able to visit Marietta. So Marietta is where her heart was, and she did manage to make it back to Marietta and died here on August 24th, 1836, and she's buried in Mound Cemetery. Her obituary that you see on the left of the screen states that the best eulogy is to say that to those who knew her, no eulogy is necessary. So I'm wondering if William Mills had stayed in Marietta and, and lived, what kind of uh, influence he would have been on the future generations of the Mills family. He, he certainly was a courageous patriot and pioneer, but he was not cultured, he was not well educated and not very religious. Um, but yet that seemed to have been uh, cultivated, that type of, of atmosphere in the family of um, Sally Bowman Mills True and her husband Jabez. So we wonder who was the real influence on the later Mills generations. So I'm going to leave Scott to tell you more about them. Okay. I'll do a little bit of camera focusing here. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to continue on with um, what uh, Linda began with and hopefully address some of the very frequently um, recurring names that you'll hear over and over and over again and try to lay these out in more of a genealogical chart uh, version here to hopefully uh, uh, dispel some of these um, uh, recurring uh, parts of this. So uh, the Mills and Gates family trees that I'll talk about here, hopefully will tie Linda's comments with what Jerry's gonna be talking about with William Webster Mills and his wife, Betsy Shipman Gates Mills. Uh, at the top left, uh, this is the, the Captain William Mills that, that Linda was just talking about, uh, who was um, remarried, his widow remarried, uh, not widow. <laughs> uh, she probably thought he, uh, she should be a widow, uh, <laughs> uh, who remarried uh, Dr. Jabez through after their divorce. Um, Captain, uh, Captain Mills was the only, as um, Linda talked about, uh, the, the son of Colonel John Mills. Um, and the Colonel John Mills, again, named after uh, his grandfather, was again, in the middle part of this particular screen here. Uh, he went to work at the age of 18 for Dudley Woodbridge, the very first merchant here in Marietta, and by the age of 21 was running the store for Dudley Woodbridge. He worked in the mercantile business for over 40 years. He was a Marietta College trustee from their very uh, earliest uh, part and founding of that college. He also served as their treasurer for many years without pay. He became president of the Bank of Marietta starting in 1824 and later the Marietta National Bank, as well as the president of the Marietta Chair Company, one of the largest employers in the area for many, many years. When his bank wasn't able to approve many of the loans that people came to get secured because of their inability to pay back those loans, Colonel John was also said to have personally funded some of those uh, uh, requests out of his own pocket to aid in a great act of charity 
without a lot of great fanfare within the community. He was a very charitable man. In the same manner, he also showed great philanthropy to improve his community, giving a lot of financial gifts to many organizations, including Marietta College as their treasurer, paying some of their bills out of his own pocket to keep them afloat. Colonel John Mills was quite an extraordinary man of obvious influence and also like his stepfather and mother uh, influenced his succeeding generations greatly. He was actually married twice, first to Deborah Wilson, who I don't have a, a photograph of here, just a little silhouette, a generic silhouette. Deborah was from a very prominent family also. In fact, if you go to Mound Cemetery today, you might recognize this um, praying um, figurine on top of a small mound in Mound Cemetery for her mother. Uh, this is Deborah Wilson's mother, uh, part of the Spencer um, and Brainerd family, uh, Martha Brainerd Spencer Wilson. Back to the, the other chart here. Um, after Deborah's death in 1842, um, Colonel John remarried Dorothy Webster. Uh, she was a woman of, of great distinction. Dorothy Webster Hall is named for her on the campus, uh, done so by her, her two sons, John and, and William. Um, and William, of course, uh, with the, the three children that they had, uh, John, their sister who only died uh, after a year of, of after her birth, uh, Mary Coleman Mills, and then William Webster, the person that is kind of the subject of what Jerry is going to be talking about here today. On the other side of the family of this power couple, uh, back in the, the, the mid 1800s. On the other side of that is Betsy Gates Mills. She's the one in Betsy Shipman Gates uh, in the bottom right hand corner here. The youngest of, of the family, as you can see, was born quite a bit later than her two siblings. Um, Betsy was the granddaughter of a congregational church minister named Reverend Aaron Gates. He was a graduate of Williams College in Massachusetts, but his pastoral duties severely limited his family income. As a result of that, Betsy's father, Beeman Gates, there in the middle, uh, attended Amherst College uh, for just a year before he was forced to drop out and um, find another occupation to make ends meet and support the family. Um, he found odd jobs to earn a few bucks here and there, mostly by teaching school, as well as singing, something he was very accomplished and, and very well known for at a very young age. When he was just 18 years old, he was selected by Lowell Mason, a name some of you might have heard of, the great hymn composer. He composed over 1600 hymns during his lifetime. He was also a famous director uh, in the Massachusetts area. He picked out Beeman at the age of 18 to be a soloist in Handel's Messiah in Boston. Quite an honor. The year after this occurs in 1837, Beeman sets out with his brother-in-law, uh, Ansel Moody. They have plans to travel to New Orleans for better job prospects for, for Beeman, but also to get his brother-in-law, Ansel, a place that has a little bit better weather to hopefully improve his failing health. They traveled from Massachusetts, eventually came down the Ohio River, and because of some of those health issues, they were forced to, to get off of the boat temporarily here in Marietta, where his health slowly improved to a point where they were able to reboard another boat to continue on down toward New Orleans. Unfortunately, when they got to Kentucky, his health took a turn for the worse yet again, and they decided to turn back and hopefully make it back to Boston. That would not happen. In fact, they stopped here in Marietta yet again. Uh, again, because of those uh, health issues, they took up uh, residence in a boarding house. And as a result of that, as his health declined further and further, the two stayed in that boarding house with Beeman, both singing as well as playing the flute to try to raise his spirits and uh, improve his hopeful uh, health and, and nursing back to health. A short time after they arrived here for the second time, Mr. Moody would die 
and would be buried at Mound Cemetery. Hearing the music coming from the boarding house on numerous occasions, several members of the Congregational Church on Front Street, um, following the death of Mr. Moody, approached Beeman before he left town and offered him a job as the head of their choir, as the lead choir director, uh, something he was certainly well, um, um, well acquainted with and, and well suited for that particular job. This group of men that went and gave him this job offer was led by his future father-in-law, Charles Shipman. This is Charles, shown here on the left, a very well-educated man who went to the Marietta Academy and a well-known local businessman. He worked for his father, Joshua Shipman, as Joshua oversaw the construction of the original congregational church on Front Street. Ironically, Charles also worked at a local drugstore run by Dr. Jabez True, the guy Linda talked about. Uh, Charles Shipman and his wife, Joanna Bartlett, who's shown here in the middle, had six children, the third of which was their daughter, Betsy Sybil Shipman Mills, not the Betsy Mills we know of today. Again, this is where it gets all confusing. Uh, she was an amazing woman in her own right. Betsy Sybil Shipman was born in Athens. Uh, she had a wonderful sense of humor and a great writing style that can be experienced if you find her book um, very rare, but uh, some of that stuff is available in special collections and other places called Grandmother's Letters. She loved to travel. She studied music in Lancaster, which probably was that connection with Beeman. And she met Beeman when she was just 21 years old upon her family's return here to Marietta. She was an avid, avid collector of antiques, not something that we associate with folks of the, of the 19th century. Um, the family history states that um, she also called this antique collecting hunting for relics. <laughs> she describes her hobby in one letter to one of her children with this quote. I came home and found your father wondering where I had gone, but he knows that the, that the town crier will hunt me up if I was lost. So he was waiting very patiently to see if I came home all right before he sent out the, the crier to round him up, round her up. Uh, with the bell and the cry, an old woman is lost. An old woman is lost. She dresses in black and goes about hunting up relics. An old woman is lost. She had a great sense of humor here. Um, her family also was always her number one priority, uh, but a very close second, even ahead of the relic hunting that she was often uh, engaged in, was her love of genealogy. Again, not something that you think of with the 19th century uh, folks. In 1876, she wrote about her plans to travel to the genealogical library in Boston by saying this, I am anticipating a great deal of pleasure in spending an entire week or more there. She's a woman after my own heart, takes her vacation and goes to the library. And their daughter, um, you can see here on the previous slide, on the right-hand side is Betsy Sybil Shipman Gates, wife of Beeman. And this is a little bit later picture of her. Uh, the Gates family, Beeman and Betsy, the, the ones there in the center, uh, were the leaders of the Congregational Church Choir for many years. After establishing himself as the choir director, Beeman went into several business ventures. He took over the ownership of the Marietta Intelligence or newspaper and edited that newspaper for many, many years. He was involved in the very early sale of lubricating oil produced here and sent off to markets in Europe. He established the First National, the First National Bank of Marietta and ran that institution until his son-in-law, William Mills, took over. He was a Marietta College trustee and also helped to bring the Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad project to fruition, becoming its vice president and superintendent. And I'll wrap up the genealogy portion of this by saying Beeman and Betsy had three children that are shown here. Mary on the left, um, Mary Beeman Gates, wife of Civil War General Rufus Dawes, whose home uh, was right across from the Betsy Mills originally before they moved up here just a few doors up 4th Street uh, to the Dawes home uh, just next to the um, Catholic Church rectory. 
Uh, the center is Charles, uh, their only son, uh, a Marietta College student who would prevent General John Hunt Morgan's raiders, Confederate raiders from crossing the Buffington Island Ford along with other members of the Marietta and Athens County militia that prevented Morgan from crossing the day before the battle, which would lead to his capture of, of many of his men and their eventual um, flight uh, to northern parts of Ohio before the rest of the group was captured. Charlie wanted to get back into the action, uh, but the family was very hesitant of, of letting him do that with his studies still ongoing. But in May of 1864, they finally relented and allowed him to join up for just 100 days, a group that was going to put a final end to the war with one final push. So in May of 1864, he boarded a train with a lot of other Marietta and Washington County veterans. Uh, and as the train left Marietta, just beyond Moore's Junction, the train jumped the track, killing several. But Charlie was pretty uh, seriously injured, but fearing that he would not, if he returned to Marietta, he would not be allowed to rejoin the unit again. And this was his one chance to go and serve his country in a formal manner, uh, he continued on. As they reached Harper's Ferry, uh, his wounds and injuries could no longer be hidden, and he was put off the train, uh, went into a hospital, and they found out it was much more serious, called the parents who rushed to his side, only to learn when, the, when they got there that he had passed away. He would die in the hospital before they ever got there to say their final goodbyes. And final, finally, Betsy, the namesake sake of the institution, which we know, all know here in Marietta, just uh, about a block and a half from Marietta, which is this institution uh, in the top left-hand corner for folks that aren't quite as familiar with it. Um, the Betsy Mills Club, uh, this is the end of my particular portion, uh, has a direct connection uh, between those Mills family and the castle here uh, the last owners of the castle were the brother and sister, Bertland and Stuart Mosley, who are pictured in the top right-hand corner with Betsy and William in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, after Bertland's death in 1989, Stuart made arrangements to transfer the house and property upon his death. And after several conversations, uh, that was finally completed following his death, forming the Betsy Mills Corporation. Because of the proven track record of over 60 years of service in the Marietta community, Stewart had documents drawn up to transfer this beautiful structure, as he put it, quote, a historical asset for the city of Marietta with such asset to be used for educational and public purposes, unquote. Stewart died in 1991 before all the details were finalized, but his wishes were fulfilled with the formation of Betsy Mills Corporation that also included the castle. That relationship continued until just last year in 2021, when the castle spun off and formed their own independent nonprofit corporation. Um, in the same spirit that the Gates and Mills family established, um, they established an enduring legacy of commitment to education and the betterment of their community for both institutions, the Betsy and the castle. And both, I believe, are thriving today. It's good to have Carrie Jean, the director of the of the Betsy Mills Club here joining us today. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Jerry to tell William and Betsy's story. Technology. Well, Linda and Scott have shared the background about the Mills and the Gates family. Now, I have the privilege of introducing you to William and Betsy Gates Mills. William was born in 1852, and Betsy was born one year later. They were both blessed, as Scott has shared, with wonderful parents who were highly respected and contributing members of the Marietta community. They were families that valued education, a commitment to the community and religion, and they were families who knew each other very well. Betsy, as Scott shared, was a daughter of Beeman and Betsy Gates, 
and was the youngest of their three children. Her family nickname was Betty, and that's probably because her mother was also Betsy. William, being the son of John and Dorothy Webster Mills, had an older brother, John, and from birth, Betsy and William were neighbors living on the same block, Betsy in what is now the original part of the Betsy Mills Club and William in what is now the president's house on the campus of Marietta College. Oops. And I'm sure you recognize these, William's home being the president's house, Betsy's home being the original house and by the way, for you Congregationalist, it was once the parsonage of the Congregational Church. And then down below is Millgate, which is a home that was built later, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. We have very little information about their childhoods, but we can presume that they were playmates and friends. Chances are the college campus was their playground, but William didn't always want to play with Betsy. Now I want to explain to you about this little card and also the box in the middle that has cards in it. Betsy had this absolutely wonderful and very poignant custom that she did on each, each wedding anniversary. She would write a little memory to William and then it would be placed in this box and there's a whole collection of them. But anyway, this is one of them and I will be showing others. And this one says, about 50 years ago, you did not come to see me at all. Now, this is to William. You were playing with boys and had no use for girls with curls. <laughs> but I saw you look out of the corner of your black eyes when you went past our side gate on which I was swinging. I hollered at you, but no, sir, you would not play with girls. Oh, Willie, Willie. <laughs> William's father, Colonel John Mills, was a founder, trustee, treasurer, and generous, be generous benefactor to the college. Chances are that from an early age, William connected with students and faculty in their activities, and Betsy, being the youngest child in her family, most likely enjoyed lots of attention from Mary and Charlie and her parents. I got out of order here. Okay. Betsy and William's parents were devoted members of the First Congregational Church. From a young age, Betsy and William participated in church activities, and guess what? They joined the church on the same day in 1869. I will later share this how this commitment became a devoted mission in both of their lives. But this, this slide shows, first of all, a photo of the original Congregational Church. And this little card says this. It describes a church activity that Betsy and William enjoyed. It says, do you remember how fond we were of trimming the church 43 years ago? Do you remember how you went into the gallery and put up evergreens while I stood below and admired your skill? Oh, you were such a wonderful boy. <laughs> and I have included, you'll see the colored strange photograph there. I wanted, I put that there because I want you to know that tradition continues. We still, as the Congregationalists here know, we still decorate the gallery. Both Betsy and William shared tragedies as young people. Scott shared the tragic death of Betsy's brother, Charlie, when she was 11 years old. And she shared this memory with William on that little card on the left. 47 years ago, since this little maiden looked out the window to see you running by, a great sorrow had come to my childish heart. My big brother, my soldier brother had gone and our mother was clothed in black and her eyes were a fountain of tears. These were sad days for your little girl, Willie boy. William, in the right, also suffered a personal tragedy. In 1872, the year following his car college graduation, he ducked into a partially constructed building on Front Street 
to find shelter from a very severe windstorm. The building collapsed, killing one person and severely injuring William. For several weeks, his family did not know if he would survive, and his recovery took a year with lingering effects for the rest of his life. And in this card, Betsy says, 39 years since you came so near being killed, what would my life have been without you? Do you remember the basket of flowers and the fruit that came to you? Oh, my dearest. We do know that William attended the Marietta Academy, which I gather was sort of a high school for high, for high school instruction, and that Betsy attended Ipswich Female Seminary in Ipswich, that's a hard name to say, Ipswich, Massachusetts, for post high school instruction. And then William graduated from Marietta College with Phi Beta Kappa honors in 1871. And so the photos on this slide show a, a sort of a vintage photo of the Marietta College campus and above is William's graduation photo. And then there's a younger photo of Betsy and also a photograph or drawing, I'm not sure which, of the Ipswich Female Seminary. In 1973, after recovering from his injuries, William accepted a position in the banking business with his brother-in-law, Isaac C. Elston Sr. in Crawfordsville, Indiana. He worked there for 14 years, proving himself an asset to the business and community. And this was a pattern he would follow the remainder of his life as he returned to Marietta. And now guess what, wedding vows. On October 12th, 1875, William and Betsy were married by Reverend Theron Hawks of the Congregational Church. And she says, remembering this, and this is our wedding day. Were we married then or ages ago before we were born? Seems to me that we have always been married. Oh, that crisp, frosty October morning. Do you remember my wedding dress? What do you think? Do you think he did? <laughs> Probably not. But she wanted him to. The two shades of gray and the overskirt. How Mrs. Andrews and Aunt Lucina cried but we shed no tears, thus began our new life. So then Betsy also moved to Indiana, where she also became very involved in community activities. And even after they moved back to Marietta, they continued their contacts with their Indiana friends throughout the rest of their life. They wanted children, but that did not happen. And this little card relates to that. Still celebrating our wedding day, our day, but no new birthdays in our family, just the two. But how near and dear we are growing to each other. We loved each other on our wedding day. How about now, Willie boy? It's always so cute to when she calls him Willie boy, this very prominent businessman. It's really cute. But their lives were not without without children, because her sister Mary, married to Rufus Dawes, had six children, and you can see all their names here, and I won't even begin talking about them, because that would be uh, probably two more hours. Well, I, I'd have to let Scott talk about it. <laughs> anyway, they became their family, and they were very devoted to these children throughout the rest of their lives. In 1887, they moved back to, to Marietta so that William could take over the position of president of the First National Bank to replace his father-in-law, Beeman Gates, who was in ill health. They moved back into their previous home. That would be what we know as the president's home on the edge of the college campus. And there's a photo of what was the First National Bank. And I don't know if you can tell from there, but the location is actually front and green. And I believe that is probably where that antique store has been for years and years. And there is a photo that you've seen before of Beeman Gates. 
Little by little, William expanded his business interest as he, was, as he was involved in other companies, serving on the boards of several of them, including the Pure Oil Company, which was owned by his nephew, Beeman Gates Doss. He joined his brother John in various business ventures, and the family fortune was enhanced by an oil well strike in Wetzel County on property that John owned. Now, I have shared some background information about the lives of William and Betsy, their families and childhood, education and marriage, William's business interest and more. But now I want to focus on William and Betsy more personally. What were their dreams, their goals, their passions? How personally involved were they in the community? How did they relate to other people? And as I was researching the documents out then, this is the part that I found so remarkable. They were true partners in every sense. One resource stated that William never made an important decision without discussing it first with Betsy. They supported each other in all their endeavors and lived a loving life of common goals and passions. Documents show that there were three main passion in their lives, Marietta College, their Christian faith and the church first congregational and women's rights. And as I read their story, I was truly amazed with how much both of their lives were, were, about, were about service. I mentioned that William's father, Colonel John Mills had an important role in the founding of Marietta College. And I've also shared that it was part of William's life from his earliest days. Following in his father's footsteps, he was elected to the Board of Directors in 1894. He was secretary for 37 years. He was a college treasurer for 31 years. He led a drive to develop an endowment fund and his contributions kept the college alive. And as, a, as an adult, he supported the college financially as described in this quote by Edward Parsons, Marietta College president, quote, he has stood by the college with supreme loyalty. If it had not been for his belief in it and his exertions in its behalf, it probably would not be here today. He gave to it his prosperous years and when his income was limited. He often subscribed when he did not know where this money was come to meet his subscription, unquote. Often the college faced frequent financial challenges and his personal contributions and insistence on creating an endowment fund certainly helped keep the college doors open. But that wasn't all that he did. He knew every student and faculty member. He listened to their stories, often helped with their financial need and offered career advice. He handed out diplomas at every graduation and also tried to attend every college sporting event. And Betsy was equally involved with the students, listening, helping, and welcoming them, them into their lovely home, which was regarded as a part of the life of the college. And here I've just shown, picked out a few vintage photos, and these were the type of things that William probably would have attended. Of course, a picture of the campus. At 1925 Marietta College baseball team, um, a class picture from 1917, and if this is true, he would have probably known almost all those students, and then a photo of the 1929 Marietta College football team, and the arrow points to a pretty famous student and future uh, person involved with Marietta College, Don Drum. Both Betsy and William were deeply committed to the Christian faith and to the First Congregational Church. As I previously mentioned, they were members from their youth and grew even more devoted as they became adults. William assumed every leadership role you can imagine. He was treasurer of the First Religious Society, which is still to this day the financial arm of the church, teacher of the Mills class, named by its members in honor of William and Betsy. And guess what? The attendance was often near 100 members coming to Sunday school. 
Betsy also taught Sunday school, a class for young men. She was involved in all kinds of church projects and groups, especially the Women's Missionary Society, which met at their home for many years. She was acquainted with every member of the church and never failed to welcome each new member in a personal way. So this photo shows a picture of the Mills class and that doesn't look like 100 people. So this was probably one of the days that they didn't have quite that number, but still a lot of men coming to Sunday school. And down below, there are some, a newspaper clipping and um, some minutes from the Female Missionary Society. The one on the left is a history of the Female Missionary Society. What's amazing is that it was started in 1819. And, you know, when we go through the records, we can find times when they contributed um, to the Civil War. They had, uh, they made blankets, they had fundraisers. And then the next one over here on this side is from June 6, 1919. So 100 years later, they had a meeting. And you can't read the minutes, they're very hard to read. But basically, it says there was a meeting on June 6, 1919. They met at Millgate, and some people drove their automobiles, but they had actually their own trolley stop. So some of them came on streetcars and that there were 60 women present. Both Betsy and William were deeply interested in missionary work, and one of the more memorable experiences of their lives was a trip they took together to the Near East in 1910. In 1902, the church underwent a massive remodeling project, and as part of that project, William donated a beautiful organ in memory of Betsy's parents, Beeman and Betsy Gates. This was especially meaningful since Beeman had been the choir director for 30 years. So the organ on the left is the one that was donated during the remodeling. And you can see the choir loft has not yet been added so you can actually see um, the organ fairly clearly. The plaque in the middle was the one for the dedication and it's very hard to see, but if you kind of look up in the center below the pipes, that's where the plaque was. Tragically, the church was totally destroyed by a fire on February 13th, 1905, just three years after this huge remodeling project. But not surprising, William was chairman of the rebuilding committee. He also replaced the organ, added the amount to the insurance needed to purchase an identical organ. The new church was completed on February 11th, almost exactly one year after the fire and was completely paid for. Now going back, this is the organ, the second organ he donated. That is the organ that is in the church today. And it is, it is beautiful. Later, he donated a set of 10 chimes to honor his parents and his wife, Betsy. And the inscription, I don't know if you can read it all, so I will read this. It says the chime of bells was placed here in 1922 in memory of John Mills, Colonel John Mills, the honored father, Dorothy Webster Mills, the revered mother, and Betsy Shipman Gates Mills, the beloved wife of W.W. W. Mills. Now, I was trying to do some research on this, and actually, the, the bells is actually a musical instrument which consists of the bells and a keyboard. So the photo in the middle is actually what they call the keyboard, and it is how you actually play the bells. Now, these are played today every Sunday. Raise your hand if you have actually played the bells, even just one note. Okay, so a lot of us have done this. It's a very cool experience. And the photo on the left below the bells shows how the levers are marked with the notes. We are all certainly aware of Betsy's passion for helping young women 
and what was called households, household science, art, and other classes of practical education. In 1889, she established a sewing club, which first met in a building on Wayne Street at the Wayne Street Church, but later moved to the chapel of the First Congregational Church. They met on Saturday afternoons and opened the meetings by singing Onward Christian Soldiers, a prayer, and then they got busy on their sewing projects. Betsy's task was cutting out garments. The club eventually changed their name and meeting time and became the Girls Monday Club, which was founded in 1911. In 1916, William purchased Betsy's former home as a permanent place for her club. After Betsy's death, in her memory, William embarked on a huge expansion project costing $125,000. That would be over $2 million today. It was to be built in brick and added a dining room, a kitchen, a laundry, a gymnasium, a swimming pool, as well as heating, filtration, and ventilation systems. This was dedicated in 1927, with one of the speakers being her nephew, Vice President at the time, Charles Dawes, who was born in the original building. As we all know, this has remained a vital institution in our community to this day. And I, I can't tell you how much it has been a part of my life, particularly when I was, I was a younger person. Their story would be incomplete without knowing that William and Betsy frequently helped needy individuals who knocked on their door asking for assistance. According to archival records, they always listened to their stories and tried to help them in whatever way they could. Another illustration of their generosity is through their efforts to provide school lunches for students who needed them. Since there was no agency with funds to support the program, and the school lunch program was on the verge of being abandoned, Betsy stated, then I will do it myself. I will not live in a community where there are hungry children. In 1910, construction began on a home for them outside the city. It was finished in 1915, and they called it Millgate, combining both of their names. It was a beautiful place where they could relax and enjoy nature. They loved welcoming members of their Sunday school class and the women's groups to enjoy their home. Betsy died in 1920, and many beautiful condolences were made in her memory. And I found a really touching connection to the castle. The Women's Missionary Society of the Congre Congregational Church had a memorial service for her in the church chapel with touching remarks by castle resident and president of the group, Mrs. T.F. Davis, who many of us here in the castle refer to as Lucy. After her death, William wrote, the Lord gave me the intimate companionship with the one woman who I've always regarded as the best woman in the world for 45 happy and cloudless years. When William died in 1929, there were condolence letters from not only the local community, the region, the country, and even from overseas. And I want to share this memorial remark. His business talent was great and sound. Such things are always noted when distinguished man dies, but they do not tell the real story of W. W. Mill's career. It was in social service to his fellows that his most laudable work for his community was done through his private and personal relations with others. Things that were not made public that win the gratitude and love of men his counsels in business, in religion, in civic affairs, in the stimulation of youth to education were tender and sagacious. They made him the best loved man in Marietta for many, many years. These last two slides are just reminders of the more tangible gifts and connections to the Mills family. Clear over in the corner is Campus Marshes. 
And of course, we know from what Linda shared that that family was very involved in the original settlement. There is a photograph, of course, at the Marriott College campus. The brick building is Mills Hall, which was um, named in honor of the Mills family. The photo on, in the middle on the, on the right is Dorothy Webster Hall, the uh, dormitory they, don they donated and named for their mother. Down in the lower left is a name of a society that exists and recognizes and honors donors. And then the two photos on the bottom right are the Mills House, which is the president's house, and it was obviously where they lived. And then other, other connections was, of course, the Congregational Church, the organs, the two organs, and the chimes, and obviously the wonderful Betsy Mills Club. It is impossible, however, to measure the service and contributions they made by touching the lives of so many through kindness, assistance, and love. William and Sarah Mills, Colonel John and Dorothy Webster Mills, William and Betsy Mills, and others in their families certainly left a lasting legacy to our community for which we can all be grateful. The purpose of this presentation tonight was to share, restore, and cherish their generous spirit, which was a blessing to so many. Thank you. Now, I wanted to finish with one last slide here. Uh, it's something that I do on a lot of my particular presentations. It's a, a, a phrase that is engraved in the Pioneer Monument in Oak Grove Cemetery to honor those unknown pioneers whose uh, graves have been lost or uh, were remembered there in Oak Grove Cemetery. And the inscription, which is very faded today, says, names pass away, but deeds live on. Tonight, when we were talking about this, uh, we, we remarked, everyone knows the name, Betsy Mills, but few know the stories and the deeds. And hopefully tonight's program helped to fill in those gaps so that their names will never be forgotten. So thank you very much. So we will have time for Q&A. Um, if anyone does need to sneak out, you are more than welcome to. And for our online audience, we will be getting your questions over to our presenters. Um, so as soon as I pull up the document for you all, all right. Okay, so uh, I'll facilitate this. If, if you have any questions for, for any of the three of us, uh, please raise your hand here in the, the audience and those online. Yes, please. Oh, Grace, I'm sorry. Grace, go ahead in the back. Grace? I should know the answer. When did the house become the Marriott College president's house? Uh, the, the question uh, for those online, uh, when did the, the Mills house become the president's house? Do you know that answer, the, the date, Linda? I think it's about 1927 About 1937, the best of, of Linda's recollection. Um, okay. Uh, the, the other question here in, in person is what is the uh, location of the Millgate House? For folks in the area, it's out toward Davola. Uh, just as you're leaving town and, and past uh, 821 and the, the access to go out to the interstate, uh, if you know where the Bible College is located, it's back up in the woods up on top of the hill. There's a road access. Uh, if you go out there today, um, the James house that is newly newly built a really large one out there there's a road that leads back to that house and up over the hill that will lead you up to the the millgate house um, that was passed down through the family and the dawes family lived down right down below there as well uh, we have one on online um, just a, a, an information uh, peggy dempsey who is um, her husband's from the dawes family it said, I see a, an error in the Gates family tree. Uh oh, that's my problem. <laughs> it should be Charles Beeman Gates. I'm, sure, I'm not sure what I had in that particular one. Um, yeah, it was Charles Beeman Gates. 
uh, Charlie, as the, as he was known, he was the the gentleman who who served in the Civil War and so desperately wanted to live up to um, uh, the the battle record of his brother-in-law, uh, General uh, Rufus Dawes, and, and things of that sort, and tragically lost his life simply out of um, the hope that he would not be able to to return. So he wanted to continue on, and his injuries were a little bit too much. Uh, we have another one. Uh, I lived in the dormitories while putting myself through college at Marietta. I'm so grateful to the mills for providing this service to women. When did the dormitories start? Um, the one picture that Jerry had up there earlier with just the three buildings, uh, there was Alumni Hall and then Irwin, the, right? Uh, the one with the tower. And then there was what was called Old Dorm, uh, but which specific dormitory that she's referring to, uh, I'm not sure, but- Maybe the dormitories in the Betsy Mills house. Oh, I'm sorry. The door. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at it from a completely different perspective. Sorry about that. Yeah, there there were dormitories. Um, maybe Carrie Jean, do you have any idea what the the history of when the dormitory started at the Betsy Mills Club? When they did the renovation? Yeah, uh, that, that's a really good question. They did build some of those things into the into the process when they combined the house next door and built the dining facility. Um, I think it's reasonable to suspect that unless we find some other uh, specific information on that, but it still uses as, as a dormitory today, uh, just for women, and again, kind of leads that legacy uh, from that. Any other uh, questions in the room? I have a comment. Yes, Lila? Uh, I'm Lila Hill, and uh, my mother was a cook at the uh, restaurant in the Bethany and a lot of the professional men that had offices in downtown Marietta came there for lunch. And it was often that the, they would serve a banquet at night for some organization. And I was still living at home and wasn't married yet. And uh, so she would hire me and some of my friends to serve that banquet. And we got 50 cents an hour. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, for those online, uh, we have Lila Hill with us uh, this evening. She was talking about her mother working as a cook there at the Betsy Mills Club uh, and serving some of the, the business leaders that would frequently have dinners there and even hired Lila as a young girl uh, to, to help serve some of the banquets that they held there. Um, for folks that don't know, and I... I always hate to do this, Lila, to talk about people's ages, especially for, for ladies. But Lila is approaching her 101st birthday, correct? Next. No, it's 100 in January. It's 100 in January, so 101 in January this upcoming, just in a few months. So thank you. Thank you, Lila, and for participating in that. And yeah, she's, she has a legacy there with the Betsy Mills Club as well. Yeah, Dean. Okay, um, so Dee was talking about one of her relatives mm -hmm. who Eliza was, Jane I'm sorry, Eliza Jane Carruthers, Eliza Jane Carruthers. Uh, he was one of the first directors there at the Betsy Mills Club, and she lived there on the property in the dormitories, it was one of their very first directors. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a vital part of the community, it has been since, since its inception, even before that, um, that particular house, is, as uh, Jerry mentioned, was the parsonage for the church for a while after the Gates family. And I did, didn't mention this, the Gates family moved out of that house and offered it to the church for a specific amount of money. And then they raised the money to pay for that particular mortgage. They paid for close to half of the mortgage themselves that would be paid to themselves. So they, they donated a big chunk of what the purchase price would be so that the church would have their home uh, when they left. Uh, they were gone for, I believe, three or four years, maybe at most. They moved back to Massachusetts and then came back to Marietta. Of course, the house was then the parsonage, and they built a new house uh, near 8th and Worcester Street, 
the carriage house still exists. The house was torn down. The carriage house still exists and was incorporated into what is now the American Legion. If you look at that building, you'll see parts of the cupola from the original carriage house there on the property. So that was, that was the Gates home, which they called Beverly Place because they had moved to Beverly, Massachusetts and moved back. Yes, Jack? I don't think the story would be complete without acknowledging that there was a book written about him, Benson, who lived in that Mills house, which at that time was early, uh, later years was called The Corner. And the yes. book is called To My Best Girl. <laughs> Agreed. Written by her uh, future husband. Yes. Yeah. And um, so uh, I'll wrap it up with this. Uh, Jack, uh, who's here in, in the audience, um, wanted to point out there is a, a wonderful new book. We have the, the author of um, To My Best Girl here uh, with us today, uh, Steve Magnuson, who wrote a lot of the and compiled a lot of the letters into a story of the the Mary, uh, Mary Beeman Gates and her husband Rufus Dawes um, and their, their courtship and love affair and things of that sort, which is Betsy's old, older sister. So, and, and Steve, yes. Well, thank you, Jack and, and Scott. I just wanted to mention uh, one thing, uh, Grandmother's Letters, the little booklet was mentioned, I think Jerry mm -hmm. mentioned that. Yeah, I, I mentioned that as well. Grandmother's Letter, which is a booklet uh, from some yeah, of those things. buy that on Amazon, at least. I could. Uh, okay. Like three or four years ago, you can get everything on Amazon. They've, but, they've reprinted Betsy's, Betsy, or uh, Grandmother's Letters, which is um, Betsy, Betsy Sybil Shipman Gates, which is Betsy, our Betsy Mills mother. Right. I think mostly letters from Betsy Shipman Gates to her, her daughter, Betsy Mills. <laughs> yeah. So if you really want to get into that, you can buy the book on Amazon. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, we have two different books that you can check out. Uh, Steve's book, To My Best Girl, and, um, and the uh, Grandmother's Letters, which are both available on Amazon. So again, oh yes, Jerry, um, very quickly. I, I just wanted to mention that I think the reason the Gates sold the house and moved to Beverly, Massachusetts, that was when Betsy was at Ipswich. <laughs> yeah. And, and so they wanted the, to be close by. So yeah, the com their yeah, the comment that Jerry was talking about is um, the, the reason the Gates probably sold the house on the corner, as it was known, uh, was they moved up to Beverly, Massachusetts to be nearer to um, Betsy, eventually Betsy Shipman Gates Mills, uh, as she was going through the Ipswich uh, Female Seminary up there, and then moved back after shortly thereafter. And one so. other thing I wanted to point out that those little cards that I showed yes. and some of the photographs, they were actually emailed to me from Peggy Dempsey. Yeah. So Peggy, if you're there, thank you very much. Well, yeah, and, and uh, Peggy Dempsey, whose who's husband Rich is descended from the Dawes family, uh, said thank you for a thorough and well-developed presentation. She and her husband are the owners of that set of, of love letters uh, on the anniversaries that they do. Um, and thank you all for joining us both online as well as in person. Jerry, I wonder yes. how many little cards were in that box. Do you... I thought she told me 59. Oh, that, okay. you know, the, Steve knows about that the, too. The question is how many of those cards were in the box? I think the, the, High 50s. Uh, so for every year that she knew Will. Yeah, she for every year of her life that she was able yeah. to put those together. Okay, because so, they, weren't, they weren't married 59 years, I don't think. That's yeah. more like 25. Yeah. It was, she wrote uh, okay. October 12th every so, year. You know. So again, we're, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up for folks online. And, and <laughs> folks here in, in the, the audience are more than welcome to, to stick around and, and have some more discussions about this. Again, we want to thank you all for coming out tonight, those online that, that attended the, the program, and continue to support all of those organizations. If you get a chance here in, in town, stop and, and visit the Betsy Mills Club and that legacy. And, uh, and talk to Carrie Jean and the others down there. Great work that they're continuing to do uh, as they're approaching their 100th anniversary of the founding of that uh, great institution. So again, thank you all for coming.